Well, hello and good morning. Yes, it's me, Kenny Polkari, and today is Monday, August 26th, 2024, and here are the things you need to know. Well, JJ locked it in, right? September rate cut is now all but in the books. Now, this week, NVIDIA is about to steal the spotlight in the sense is that they better blow the galaxy up uh, because the MAG-7 is really depending upon it. RFK did what? Well, he ended his campaign and he joins the GOP. Democrats are outraged. And the Middle East begins to boil over once again. And what do we have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the cavatappi rustica. Cavatappi is just a kind of pasta. It's a curly, short little pasta. It's great. Now, the Wall Street Journal reported it like this. Powell tees up the rate cuts. Now, note the plurality, right? Cuts. Investors, traders, and algos loved what they heard, taking stocks up and up and up again. The Dow up 465 points or 1.1%. The Dow up 400, uh, 64 points or 1.1%. The NASDAQ up 260 points or 1.5%. The Russell gaining 70 points or 3.2%. The clear winner for the day. The transport's up 255 points or 1.6%, while the equal weighted S&P gain 90 points or 1.3 percent. Now note, the equal weighted index outperforms the original S&P last week, suggesting investors are really finding opportunities away from the Magnificent Seven. It was another barn burner of a day. Traders giddy with joy, right? seems to be the word of the day lately, as JJ gave the strongest signal yet about the coming rate cuts and the, and the change in monetary policy. That's meant to halt any further weakening of the U.S. labor market. Now, in his statement, J.J. said, and I quote, We do not seek or welcome further cooling in the labor market conditions, so, it is, so the time has come for policy to adjust. Now, what I find interesting is that this was completely expected, right? There's nothing new here. There's nothing that should have surprised anyone, yet it appears as if it did. Right? That's a little bit confusing because there's no reason it should have. Maybe it's because he emphasized the cooling labor market or maybe because there wasn't a hint of any hawkishness at all, causing many of them to expect a total of 100, 100 basis point cuts before the ball drops in Christmas Island. Now remember, Christmas Island is that island in the Central Pacific and is among the first places to enter the new year due to its position just west of the international dateline. Or maybe it was because he didn't remove the word gradual from his speech, suggesting that a 50 basis point cut is a possibility at any point. In any event, it is what it is. Now, just to be clear, he never put a basis point move on the coming cycle. He did not define the size or, by the way, the start date. He just said it's time traders are doing all the rest right they're, they're they're suggesting what else is going to happen now in the end his comments now bring to a conclusion what has been described as the fed's historic inflation fighting campaign a campaign that begun at this very place exactly two years ago in jackson hole wyoming now i guess it really is all about perspective though right i mean ask any member of the silent generation from 1928 to 1945 or the baby boom generation from 1946 to 1964 or even the gen x generation from 1964 to 1980 we found nothing historic about this move in fact i'm going to say that we we found it a return to normalcy after 15 years of incredibly misguided policy that left rates at zero for far too long Something, by the way, that the Gen Yers and Gen Zers came to believe was completely normal. And that is the issue. They thought that this historic, as they called it, 5% rates was usurious, suggesting it was going to break the bank. But I will also say it's really not their fault, right? That's all they knew. They can't help themselves but to think that that's true. In the end, the market was very happy with JJ because his speech felt more dovish and it left the door wide open for those larger cuts if the data continues to weaken. Okay, look, it's just time to move on now, right? Let's go. Historic was when, by the way, just let me define this. Historic was when Fed Chair uh, uh, Paul Volcker pushed rates to 21% in 1980, 81-ish. That was historic. Again, go back and ask any of those three generations I just detailed for you. They'll tell you the same thing. Anyway, every major group in the S&P advanced. Consumer discretionary up 1.9%. Now remember, those are wants versus needs. Real estate up 1.9%. Think housing, right? They led the way. Tech followed at 1.6. Energy was up 1.5. Basic materials up 1.3. Industrials up 1%. Financials up 9 tenths. 
Communications up seven tenths of a percent. Healthcare up four tenths. Utilities and consumer staples both up three tenths. Now remember, those are both needs versus wants, right? Home builders exploded up 4.3%. Retail up 2.45%. Airlines up 3.2%. Semis up 2.5%. Metals and miners up 2.5%. Cybersecurity up 1.25%. Aerospace and defense up 1%, which is still confusing to me. Oil and gas exploration up 2%. The SMIDs gained 3%. The value trade, the SPYV up 1%, while the growth trade, SPIG gained 1.15%. The triple levered long SPXL gaining 3%. And the list goes on and on and on. The VIX, which is the fear index, giving all the fear back, closing at 1586. Remember, it hit a high of 6550 on August 5th. This morning, it's up uh, 0.15 uh, at 1601 as the Mideast boils over and investors await NVIDIA earnings. Thursday, August 28th, after the close, Jensen Huang, CEO of NVIDIA, is going to take the stage to report the latest results. And while the last week of August is normally the doggiest days of the summer, that's no longer the case. NVIDIA has the whole place on edge. And let's be honest, everyone already forgot about JJ's speech. They forgot about his comments on inflation, the labor market rates. Why? Because it's no longer important, right? It's old news. But NVIDIA, well, that's new news. And it's gonna be a long week as we wait for those earnings to come out. All kinds of speculation and what ifs, right? Now let's be clear, just listen. NVIDIA is up 182% year to date, right? Got that? 182%. It started the year at 49.52 post the split and it closed at 129.37 on Friday. That's a beautiful move. Now, it did go, trade as high as 140, uh, 140 in June, and they sold that off down to 90 spot 69 in that June sell up, a 34% move lower. But they've since taken it back by 40%, right? Now, if some, if he somehow disappoints, the options market says that they're going to take 10% out of it. Who cares? I'm a buyer. And if he doesn't disappoint, then they're going to rally it by 10%. Great. I'm an owner, so I'm participating. In the end, he has to confirm that the AI hype is not just hype, that it is the real story. And just FYI, it is the real story. He is expected to report a double in earnings and revenues year over year, which is then a double B, right? Which I don't think is impossible at all, since every industry in the world is jumping on the AI bandwagon for both products and services, Garish. NVIDIA is at the nexus of this phenomenon. In any event, as a long-term investor, do not make any rash judgment. If there's any short-term negative chaos, it's sure to be short-lived. And if it flies, then strap in and enjoy the ride. Now, bonds rose in all this excitement and sent yields lower. The two years now yielding 3.88%, while the 10 years yielding 3.78%. 30-year mortgages, they're already moving lower, and that's providing all kinds of excitement in the housing market. Recall the XHB, which were home builders, they were up 4.3% on Friday, bringing its performance for the year up to 24.5%. But with lower rates, can we expect housing prices to rise? Well, we're about to find out. Oil rallied on Friday, right? There were conflicting themes here. One, the global uh, inventory shrink, leaving OPEC Plus to make a decision to raise production or not. And two, crude supplies outstrip demand. And three, China demand slows. Now, the first one is bullish for oil while the second and third arguments are bearish for oil. So what gives? Who is right? It depends on the day. And it really depends on who you are and what you care to believe. Now listen, I'm in the bullish camp. I continue to think that demand is strong and it's gonna only get stronger. And if Cami wins, then expect oil to surge. Why? Because she's gonna further restrict production uh, of fracking, right? Even though she told Pennsylvania she loves it. Then the latest Mideast turmoil is only going to push oil up, right? Now, if you didn't hear, Hezbollah launched a wave of hundreds of rockets and drones, 320 to be specific, from Lebanon towards Israel over the weekend, and Israel struck back with 100 fighter jets uh, at Lebanese targets, right, to slow this all down, raising the temperature once again in the region and raising the prospect of some disruption potentially in oil supplies. And so there's a conflicting argument there. This morning, oil is up 80 cents at 75.66, kissing the long-term trend line, which is now resistance versus it being support. The next move depends on what's going to happen over the next couple of days in the region to decide if oil pushes up or, or, or moves lower. Gold up 15 bucks this morning at 25.60 an ounce. Again, kissing all-time highs. Again, two reasons. 
One, the old JJ thing, think lower rates equals a lower dollar equals higher commodities. And two, the Mideast is in flames again as Iran ignites the fire, right? So think about gold as the safety trade. Now, let's not kid ourselves. Hezbollah is Iran, Hamas is Iran, so Iran is the problem. But we knew that too. So we're left to wonder what Cammy's policies are gonna be concerning Iran, right? She hasn't told us anything yet, and Jojo's asleep. So we're not really sure what we're gonna do, but look for gold to continue probably, to hold steady anyway, if not move higher. Eco data today includes durable goods, expected to be up 0.5%. Uh, uh, X transports down 0.1%. Dallas Fed manufacturing of negative 16.3. U.S. futures are mixed this morning. Dow futures were up, but now they're down 18 points. The S&P was up three, the Nasdaq's up 22, the Russell's up 16. Right now, investors do not appear to be concerned about the Mideast. Both sides appear to be backing down, although oil is still up 1% and will remain volatile until this really settles down. The VIX is up 1.2% this morning and probably going higher. While some investors continue to celebrate JJ, let's remember he did not specifically define the plan. He just confirmed that the next move will be down. He didn't exactly say or actually say that it was gonna be September, but that is the expectation. And I would argue that if rates do not go lower in September, then you better watch out below because the traders and algos are not gonna be happy at all. And they're all gonna run for the door at exactly the same time. Remember, I think the next catalyst for the markets is gonna be NVIDIA. European markets are mixed. Germany's down three tenths, France was up uh, one tenth of a percent. The UK is closed for holiday. Many's concerns are driving the action there in Europe as well. The S&P closed on Friday at 56.34, up 64 points. And with the latest Mideast conflict on the front page again, we can expect some churn, right? Although ceasefire talks between Hamas and Israel do continue in Egypt. I suspect that some in the media are gonna to continue to focus on JJ's comments, while others are gonna focus on NVIDIA uh, and the race to the White House, right? With only nine weeks to go until the election, you can also assume that there's gonna be a very much a part of that, that very much of that conversation is gonna be a part of the coming conversation in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the coming weeks, right? Now, over the weekend, RFK Jr. jumped ship, leaving the Democratic Party and joining forces with the GOP, and that is causing anger on one side, while it's causing curiosity on the other. Remember, while politics don't normally affect long-term investing, it does and can create short-term chaos, and there is absolutely no lack of chaos coming in the days ahead. Remember, it's important to always take a balanced approach to long-term investing. Try not to make emotional or rash decisions. Yet, don't become so complacent that you lose sight of what's going on all around you, right? Because you just have to be aware, that's all. Uh, you don't wanna get caught, you know, unknown. Do not design a portfolio to bet on one party over the other. What we hope for is that neither party, by the way, has complete control. You want to split Congress. This way it stops the stupidity from the far left and, by the way, the far right, leaving the bulk of the country and elected members of Congress smack in the middle, where I believe most Americans are, thus keeping your eye on the ball and keeping a well-diversified portfolio while continuing to add money to it is the key to winning the long-term race. Okay, so now what are we having for uh, dinner tonight? We're having the cavatappi rustica, right? Now it's a great summer dish, and the end, and it's a great end of summer dish as well as we're counting down the days till uh, Labor Day weekend, right? You get to use the fresh tomatoes from the garden and make a simple yet delicious fresh uncooked sauce, right? There's a magic that happens in your kitchen when you take these beautiful ripe tomatoes, you mix them with fresh garlic and basil, salt and pepper, olive oil, red onions, and maybe some really, really fresh made mozzarella, and then you put it over the hot pasta. Now, essentially what you're making is a summer tomato salad, and then you're just putting it over the hot pasta, right? You're gonna leave the salad so that it's, it's room temperature. You don't wanna put ice cold uh, tomato salad over the hot pasta, you want it to be room temperature. So you're gonna dice the tomatoes, you're gonna slice the red onion, you're gonna slice the garlic, add the chopped basil, season it with salt and pepper, splash of water, and a couple of turns of olive oil. Prepare it, toss it, let it marinate and sit on the counter, right? It's gonna create its own juice the longer that it sits. 
you want it to be room temperature when you mix it with the pasta. Now, if you make it the day before and it's in the fridge and you have to make sure to take it out and let it warm up, you know, for 30 minutes to an hour before you're ready to use it. Now, bring a pot of salted water to a rolling boil. You're gonna add your pasta, cook it for eight to eight to 10 minutes. You know the deal, you want it to be al dente. You do not want it to be mushy. You wanna strain it, always reserving a mug full of the pasta water or tears of the gods as we call them, uh, and take the pasta after you've strained it, return it to the pot. Now add the whole tomato salad, chunks of fresh mutts, and two or three handfuls of grated Parmigiana cheese, and then toss it really well, right? Um, you can add a splash of the pasta water if you think it's drying up and you need it, but most likely the tomatoes have made enough juice you won't need it. Serve this immediately. Uh, again, set your table outside because it's summertime. Turn on the relaxing music, set the mood, light the candles, and enjoy the setting sun on a great summer eve. It's never a rush enjoy the moment and that's what makes this dish just perfect now look it's kind of a cloudy day today right behind me you can see there's no blue sky there it's all cloudy um not really hot it's about probably 80 degrees right now here in south florida not really sure what the day is going to bring it's supposed to be a stormy week so i wonder if that's indicative of what we're going to get in the markets in any case until tomorrow i am kenny Polkari. you take good care